So hello everyone and welcome back to only my second ever YouTube Q&A. So this Q&A is going to differ from the very first one that, that I did in the sense that I haven't looked at the questions that have been asked. I mean, sure, I went through and I screenshotted the ones that I was going to answer, but I didn't actually read or interpret any of them in any meaningful detail, at least. But also every single question that gets answered here gets answered in one take. So you know my true authentic thoughts on the questions that you have asked me. So without further ado, let's get into question number one. So why don't you shave that shitty little, mo thank you, Adam. Moving on to question number two, tips to get to 100 kg bench press by the end of the year you're currently at 60 kilos so judging by that level of strength you are indeed a beginner if someone hasn't told you that by now unfortunately i have to be the bearer of bad news however you can make that be a good thing in the sense that the gains you can make over the coming months can be absolutely and utterly incredible and there's absolutely no reason why you can't go from benching 60 kilos now to in nine months time being able to bench 100 kilos so if i were in your shoes what i'd be doing is first of all practicing bench press a lot more so in order to get stronger at a particular exercise it's a good idea to practice that exercise over and over and over again ideally twice or sometimes even more frequently throughout the week the second thing that i would be doing is ensuring that within every set that i'm doing that i'm leaving absolutely and utterly everything in the tank now some powerlifting coaches won't like that approach but i'm not a power powerlifting coach they certainly know better than me but from my situation having never invested in a strength program but managing over the course of albeit six or seven years benching 180 kilos that was pretty much my strategy if you need to get a spotter to do so absolutely do so but always be pushing for incremental progressions every single week so my 180 kilo bench press after i think it was uh, the six or seven years of consistently lifting broke down to be just under 0.3 kilos of progression on the bench press each and every week. to some people that is almost so small that they'd nearly be embarrassed to pick a plate that small to add on to either side of the bar but you have to lose sight of the short term for how things can accumulate and extrapolate in the long term adding 1.25 kilo plates to either side of the bar every week or even every two weeks may sound like fuck all right now because at the end of the day it means in two weeks time you might only be benching 62.5 kilos but if you can consistently do that or at least you can consistently progress with the bench press more often than you don't give it nine months of consistency and that 100 kilo bench press you'd be embarrassed at the benchmark that you set for yourself and that's pretty much it you could invest in a powerlifting program you could join a powerlifting gym and they'd probably be able to advise you a little bit better than i could but at the end of the day those would be the main variables it's also important that if you are someone who is kind of in and out of a deficit that you commit to a prolonged period of time in a surplus of calories at least for the next nine months so you can do everything right inside in the gym but to a degree if you're constantly in a deficit or striving to be in a deficit you're potentially limiting the amount of gains that you can make so provided that you're not grotesquely overweight provided that your body fat isn't an issue for you commit to eating in a slight surplus of calories anywhere between two to five hundred above your maintenance each and every day coincided with good sleep good recovery a decent program it's gonna be a big big fucking help in terms of getting you close to that two plate bench press best bicep workout for growth not strength um I don't know anyone who tries to develop their bicep strength, but specifically not their bicep growth. So I would assume any bicep workout is to in fact make them bigger. And there is no best bicep workout. If you can pick a handful of bicep curling exercises, you don't have to look too far to find plenty of variations of that. Do that with intensity, especially with smaller muscle groups like biceps pushing all the way to fucking failure, even in some cases beyond failure with let's say assisted repetitions. Train them frequently enough so I would be doing them twice a week at a minimum especially if they're a priority for you picking two or three exercises per session three or four sets per exercise and just completely and utterly annihilate them do you need to be vaccinated to get into the u.s uh as far as i know it wasn't checked uh but i'm not actually 110 sure whether they were doing some background checks uh i don't think so but Please don't quote me on that. So the best split. So this is a very, very common question where people think that there's a certain workout split that is the most optimal or the best universally. And that simply just isn't the case. The best split for you, as cliche, as nauseating as it sounds, is the one that you can stick to. You see, you could follow the world's best push-pull leg split six days a week. But if after two weeks you're realizing, I can't fucking go to the gym six days a week, nor do I want to go to the gym six days a week, well then it isn't the best split for you. You're going to make a hell of a lot more gains doing a split going, let's say, two or three times a week consistently than five or six times a week inconsistently. As far as a split goes, there really isn't any magic to it. So long as you evenly distribute the amount of volume or work that you're doing for each body part relatively evenly throughout the week, you're not doing 
too many sets and exercises that it's so difficult to recover from that you're sore all the time but on the contrary you're not doing so little that you're barely getting a sufficient enough stimulus to grow to respond to get stronger so whether you follow three day full body split four day upper lower split five day push pull legs upper lower six day push pull legs it really doesn't fucking matter the first question you need to ask is how many days can i consistently make it to the gym and from there you'll be whittling down the amount of splits that's relevant to you to follow I hold good muscle mass but seem to hold on to excess fat. How should I be training? So your priorities are completely skewed here. So training is not specific for fat loss. Training has got very little, if anything, to do with fat loss. And I'm talking about weight training here. Weight training should be solely for the maintenance and the building of strength and muscle. It should not be done with an interest in burning as many calories as possible or trying to do high reps to somehow burn fat. That is not how that works. If you are holding on to excess fat, you, my friend, are currently eating too much for the amount of exercise, the amount of activity that you do. So the first thing that you need to do is find a way to reduce the overall amount of calories that you consume across the course of the day and or increase the amount of calories that you expend throughout the course of a day, whether that's through cardio, whether that's through increasing your step count, cycling to or from work or college or school. So focus on your calories and your activity in order to sort out the fat loss. Continue with the weight training to build and grow muscle. This idea that high reps for fat loss, low reps for muscle growth is complete and utter bullshit. You can build muscle throughout a wide variety of rep ranges and no matter whether you go high reps or low reps, there's not going to be any increased benefit or at least tangible increased benefit as far as your fat loss goes. Especially if you keep stuff in your face like Bruce Bogtrotter. Am I happy with my new hair? And would I recommend the clinic that I used? So for those of you who don't know, I went to a clinic called Now Hair Time in Turkey and I hand on heart, I paid full whack for this procedure. I cannot be happier with how it has so far come out so it's not done yet but more or less like fucking this is as good as it gets like my hairline was something that was pretty shit something that really really bothered me for a very very long time and to be able to go around with the full lid a decent fucking hairline is something that has contributed tenfold to my overall confidence and it is something that i completely and utterly recommend if you're someone and i know the pain and i know how patronizing it can feel when someone with a full head of hair is telling you to just shave it and whatever else especially when you don't want to fucking shave it which was the boat that i was in so you can go around for the next number of years trying to painfully comb over your fucking hair, pretending that it's not something that bothers you as, as much as it does, or you can do something about it. And if you had shit teeth, you'd probably go to three dental, you'd probably pay three grand to get a set of braces for nine months to fix your teeth. If you have a shit head of hair, I really don't see the difference in going to Turkey, paying three grand, recovering for six to nine months, and having a full fucking head of hair. So if you're thinking about it, my advice is to simply just do it. Within reason, of course. There's so some people who think that their hairline is shit when it's it's absolutely not. And most people would kill to have their hairline. I do think there's a balance there with that. But for someone who's walking around looking like fucking Dr. Evil from fucking Austin Powers, by all means, man, go and get it done. Do I sometimes feel a bicep fatigue in exercises, chest exercises like the cable fly? And yes, I absolutely do. That's because when you when you think about it, as your arm is coming back this way, there's a degree of like flexion and extension at the bicep as well. Uh, it's not a huge amount, but there is still enough to feel a bit of a stretch, a bit of a stimulus, and hence a bit of fatigue on the bicep. Train push pull twice a week. Should I progressively overload each session or week? You should be looking to progressively overload whenever the fuck you can progressively overload. Every single time that you go into the gym, that you're fresh, that you're in a position to add more weight, do more reps, improve your technique, you should be aiming to do so. So progressive overload is not something that you decide to do in some sessions and don't decide to do in others. It's something that if it's there for the taking, fucking take it. Now it might be a little bit different for like a powerlifting program or strength program, but I'm not a powerlifting coach, as I've said already. So any opportunity that presents itself to progress with an exercise, regardless of what split you're following, you should be aiming to take advantage of it. At the end of the day, your muscles are currently equipped to withstand the particular stressors that it's accustomed to receiving on a daily and a weekly basis. So in order to cause those muscles to grow, to get stronger, you're going to have to expose it to a higher stress, a higher stimulus that it's currently not equipped to handle right now. So when your body recognizes, oh fuck, this is more weight than I'm typically used to doing, guess I'm going to have to break myself down, repair, grow more muscle, get stronger. So the next time this fucker adds this specific weight to me, I'm going to be able to handle it a little bit better and so on and so forth. So how is the hairline coming along? So as you can see here, it's pretty fucking decent. So depending on how long you're following me, 
I had a pretty fucking atrocious hairline. Uh, but right now I'm a, just short of six months into the recovery process. And to be honest, I can't be fucking happier with how it has gone. What is my motivation that drives me? So I'm not a particularly motivated individual. I just know the things that I need to do to ultimately do what I want to do. Um, I don't want to work for someone else. Uh, it's something that I learned in my very, very first job on a construction site all those years ago, just after finishing school. I hated being told what the fuck to do. I hated being spoken down to. And hence, I decided from that day forth that whatever it is I do for a career in the future, that it will not be in accordance with someone else's wishes. It'll be in accordance with mine. So that is pretty much it at the end of the day. I happen to enjoy fitness. I happen to be good at it. I happen to be good at coaching people. So I show up each and every day in order to sustain that way of living to do the things I need to do. And and this idea that it's you're, you're going to be some lightning bolt of motivation is going to come down from the gods above and that you're going to, from that day forth, implement and do the things that you need to do. Is, it's a complete not a pipe train. You are never going to be perpetually motivated to do the things that you need to do that you feel are going to improve the quality of your life. You either make a decision now that you keep doing the things you've been doing up until now and you keep receiving the same results and stay in the same circumstances that you're in right now, or you change your habits and your behaviors and hence you change your outcomes. It is very, very simple. There'll be days where you're motivated to get up and do these things. There'll be more days when you're not, but understanding a vision of where you want to go, the person you want to be, and also understanding the steps that you're going to have to take every single day to get there is paramount to you staying consistent and staying true to that path. So long story short, you either do it or you don't. Worst injuries I've suffered. So I have broken my elbow when I was four. So you can see there's like a bit of a scar there above the elbow where the doctor had to, apparently it was a very, very serious surgery that he had to be called out of bed. He was, he was on call um, and this specific surgeon had to come in and rewire my elbow. Otherwise I potentially could have lost I don't know if I lost my arm, but definitely lost use of my elbow. So that was when I was like four years old. I was trying to do a Superman dive on a futon that was standing on its side. I went backwards, the futon went forwards, stuck my hand behind myself to catch myself. Bob's your uncle, Mary's your aunt. So that was probably the worst one. Oh, actually, I caught my thigh in a thorn bush many, many years ago at a football competition down in school and I went to yank my thigh out of that thorn bush but the thorn was really and truly embedded within my thigh and it ended up ripping uh, I think it was like a four inch hole in the skin so you could actually see the tissue the blood everything else so it fucking absolutely completely severed open my leg and then my worst injuries as far as the gym goes probably a couple of back spasms here and there from both rugby from back squatting I got a couple of bad back spasms there had a few concussions on the rugby field but listen it's just part of life isn't it I think this ties nicely into kind of an idea that I've been thinking about an awful lot lately and that is the fact that movement in many cases is medicine so I think a lot of people over sensationalize certain niggles and injuries that they get to the point that they end up debilitating themselves because they perceive that this pain or this strain is not normal and when you think about it injuries are just part of life within reason, of course. And if you decide that every single strain that you get is completely and utterly abnormal and there's something wrong with you, well, then that's going to play out into your everyday existence. You're going to be someone who's afraid of any sudden movements. Any movements that you then make are going to be much, much more painful. Whereas if you're someone who just accepts it, you know, sometimes I'm going to be sore in certain places. It's fine. It's probably as a result of X, Y, or Z, or it's just something that's normal. You carry on with your day to day that person will probably have better outcomes when it comes to pain compared to the person who completely and utterly shells up. Now, I'm not talking about people who fucking break their legs or completely and utterly sever their spine, obviously. It goes without saying that, that it's barred the obvious exceptions. What's my max squat, bench, and deadlift? So, they're my maxes, of course, but they're not something that I've ever tried to consciously improve. I've never tried to consciously improve my one at max on the squat. I've never tried to improve my one at max on the deadlift. I have tried to improve my one at max on the bench press. That remains to be 180 kilos. The deadlift, I think the most that I've picked off the floor is 240 kilos. Again, never trained deadlifts consistently, just kind of did it one day. So that, that was 240 without any fucking deadlift training. And then my squat, again, never. In the early days, I did try to increase my one rep max on the squat until the squat started to pose a bit of a problem for me injury-wise. But at the most that I've ever done for one rep is 190 kilos. Where do I see myself in 10 years? Very, very hard to know. I do think that I will have other things going on aside from simply just being the fitness guy regurgitating the same things that he was regurgitating 10 years prior, or at least I would hope so. Um, I think it's important to understand that with social media and everything else, that evolution is bound to take place and you either evolve or 
you die out and you become less relevant over time. I certainly don't want to be a 35, 36 year old parroting the exact same things that I was parroting 10 years ago. I would like to think I would have other ventures that I've delved into, other things going on and just kind of evolved with the times, so to speak. At the end of the day, I'm 24 now, so I may still just about be hanging on to the title of being up and coming. And in 10 years time, there's going to be plenty of other people who are up and coming doing the exact same stuff that I am doing now. Would I try a powerlifting meet? So obviously I'm do recording my YouTube videos out of a powerlifting gym here in Limerick. So city gym, pretty, pretty, pretty big powerlifting gym with a lot of fucking strong fuckers inside there. They are trying to rope me into training powerlifting for an extended period of time up until doing a meet just for the sake of it and usually I would say no but I'm not completely closed off to the idea because I'm like it would be great content for social media you know doing eight weeks or 12 weeks of powerlifting prep seeing what I can increase my wonder at maxes by because I know for a fact that if I was to follow one of their powerlifting splits inside there that my bench would probably go way above 180 kilos that my deadlift would probably be getting close to 300 and my squat would surely be I would say moving towards 220 or five plates I've no doubt about that they're very very good at what they do and strength is something that's I suppose more specific than building muscle building muscle is like throwing a load of shit at a wall and hoping that it sticks and you know if you're doing anything right a lot of it will but with with specifically developing strength it's a different ball game and it is far more of a specific sort of science so the boys inside and gym have that down to a t i'll be probably interested at some stage in doing it just for the content side of things but also just to see what my strength potential is um but right now it's not really something that i'm thinking about as a lean teenage beginner how should you bulk so it doesn't really matter whether you're a teenager or you're 20 or 50 or fucking 60. If you want to bulk, the pr principles are going to remain the same. And there's never a point where a dirty bulk is warranted. Um, just going to put that out now. If your goal is to build muscle and you're chowing down 6,000, 7,000 calories, gaining fucking two kilos of fat a week, you're an idiot. So every single bulk should be slow, steady, conservative, with a view to minimizing the amount of fat that you gain over time so that you can prolong the lifespan, the period of time that you dedicate towards bulking and hence getting as strong as possible and building as much muscle as possible. So with that said, the surplus that you're in should be very conservative. Anywhere between 200 to 500 on the upper end of the limit of a surplus. So of calories additional to your maintenance. You keep your fat gain relatively in check. You try to keep your weight gain for most people between that 0.2 kilos to 0.5 kilos of body weight gain per week. You get into the gym, you ensure that your execution, your intensity, your technique is all good with all the exercise that you're doing, that you're consistently seeing a relatively linear progression in terms of the weights that you're lifting, the reps that you're performing on those given exercises, and ultimately sustain that for as long as possible. If you continue to see a slow but steady increase in your body weight over time, correlated with a slow and steady increase in your performance metrics inside in the gym, you're going to be building muscle. And it just becomes a case of how long can you sustain that into the future. So the biggest enemy to people on a bulk is putting on too much fat too quickly. Because after four weeks or six weeks of starting a bulk, they're looking in the mirror going, I'm a fat fucking piece of shit. And then they end up cutting again. And they never really break that cutting, bulking cycle. They never give any extended period of time to the bulk and hence they never dedicate any extended period of time to building as much muscle as possible. How do you know if you're overtraining? So uh, in most cases, I think it's very, very difficult for people to literally overtrain. And what I mean by that is that you're probably far more likely to be under training than you are overtraining. However, there are some cases in which it's very, very viable that you're just doing too much. If you're doing double figure fucking amount of exercises per workout or close to it consistently, you're probably running the risk of, you know, overtraining. If you're in the gym five, six, seven days a week, you're, you're, you're not really taking any sort of strategic rest days. Your performance in the gym is sluggish. You're never really progressing. You're sore all the time. You're starting to hate the gym. It's probably a byproduct of you taking the piss with the amount of work, the amount of volume, the amount of training that you're doing. So this is why it's really, really important to, if especially if you're someone who's training five or six days a week, to every couple of weeks, take a step back, take a couple of days off the gym, maybe go into the gym, strip back everything by 50% and just rinse your body of all the fatigue that it has accumulated over the past number of weeks. So if you are someone in the gym five, six times a week, you're training pretty hard, pretty consistently, there will come a time where you'll just have to take a step back to dump whatever fatigue you've built up. And then a couple of days later, get back into the rhythm of things. You feel a much fresher your performance will be better and hence your progression can continue to increase again so yeah you're tired you run down you're hating starting to hate the gym you're sore your performance in the gym is stagnating or doesn't seem like it's going anywhere 
probably all good signs that you're doing the dog in it. Am I doing all my own video editing? No. So I have a lovely gentleman called Jamie Moore, who is both my videographer and my editor. So he has been doing a fantastic, fantastic job of increasing the quality of my uh, YouTube videos and long may that continue. His Instagram handle is photos by Jamie, if you wanted to give him a shout and I'll put his link in the description here. Do I prefer working out in the morning or the evening time? So I prefer working out generally in the evening time. I feel a little bit stronger compared to the morning time. Albeit there are some occasions in which I would prefer working out in the morning time. If I have a lot going on on a particular day, sometimes it's good to just get up, get your workout done early, and then you have the rest of the day to do whatever it is that you want to do. But whether there's a preference or a superiority or inferiority to training in the morning or training in the evening, largely down to personal preference. Some people, can only train in the morning or evening and some people prefer to train in the morning and the evening so whatever one that you prefer to do whichever one you can stick to more consistently do that it's not going to be the difference of you let's say building muscle versus not fucking building muscle what would be my dream physique and who did i look to look up to when i started so my dream physique is i would say it, it look it's always going to be arnold Arnold's physique, I think, is pro probably the mo single most aesthetic physique that has ever existed and likely will ever exist again. So that has been what I've been chasing. Big chest, big arms, fairly dominant legs, nice uh, waist ratio. He also had kind of blocky abs, I think, that made his physique a lot more impressive. Um, and with respect to who I looked up to when I started, there was a man called Lazar Angelov. He used to be the screensaver on my phone. He was like a Eastern European fitness model. Again, absolutely outrageous genetics and insertions as far as his muscle bellies and things went. Absolutely looked insane. Don't know what he's doing now, but he was definitely someone that I looked up to when I started. And I always had the perception that, look, I may never look like these guys. And yes, these guys may well be taking steroids and it may be impossible for me to get to the physical conditions that they hold, but I didn't let that stop me from taking inspiration from them. I didn't let that demotivate me. I looked at what they were able to achieve and I go, do you know what? If I was to implement similar habits, behaviors on a daily basis that these people do, if I was to take my nutrition seriously, if I was to hit the gym consistently, yes, I might necessarily look like Lazar Angelov or I might look like Ulysses or Mike Thurston, but I'd be looking a hell of a lot fucking better than when I started out. And that's my whole point around comparison. You can either let comparison demotivate you or you can let comparison be the biggest fucking motivator you've ever had in your life. If you can just lose this idea of resenting what someone else, is, else has and instead going, do you know what? That person has managed to achieve X. Why the fuck can't I? That'll be the single biggest mindset shift that you will ever make in your entire life. And all of a sudden, instead of feeling down or deflated, seeing other people having nice things, you'll go, fuck it. I'm better than that person. I can do exactly what that person is doing. What do I need to do to also achieve something similar? What's my current weight? My current weight is a hundred and about three kilos, probably slowly but surely creeping up, judging by a physique update I took the other day where I'd like copious amounts of lower back fat, uh, but it's in around that 103 sort of mark. The heaviest I've ever been is 112. 0.5 kilos and the lowest that I've ever been in recent times. I think it's been about 96 back in 2021 uh, I'd be doing well to get down to fucking 96 now. I'll put it that way The returns that I get from dieting tend to sort of max out at around 101 Maybe 100 kilos max there to, for me to push below 100 kilos would require real consistency Real dedication you'll probably be venturing into the realm of kind of like physique prep And um, so pretty much around that 100 kilo to 101 kilo range is pretty much where I'm lean to the point that it's relatively comfortable and that to push beyond further than that it's going to take a hell of a lot of an investment how was skiing so skiing was was overall quite good so it, it taught me an awful lot about the importance of when you start something new you have to prepare to be shit and one of my favorite phrases is that in order to become the master at something you have to first submit yourself to being a fool and on your first ever day of skiing anyone who's ever done skiing a fool you will fucking be so i was like bambi Myself and my mate Axel couldn't stand up in a set of skis, let alone fucking move from A to B. Was falling over every fucking five meters that we did. Was trying to pizza down a blue slope. I fell probably in excess of 150 times. I had bruises. I still have bruises all over my body from it. But the thing is, you get knocked down 150 times, you get back up 151. And it's having that mindset of, of understanding where you are, understanding that it's going to be shit. Things are going to be tough to begin with. But over time, if I can keep showing up, if I can keep taking these hits, keep getting back up, well then in an, a couple of days, a couple of weeks, a couple of months, a couple of years fucking time, whatever the, whatever the case may be, I'm going to be a hell of a lot better 
than the first day that I started. And by day three with skiing, the learning curve is very, very quick. So the first day is going to be shit, you're going to be sore, you're going to fucking hate it. But then day two, you might get slightly better. And then I think in most cases, day three slash day four, you're fucking flying down blue slopes. So it was, a, it was a very, very valuable experience. Overall, enjoyed it a lot and will definitely be doing it again very, very soon. What is my biggest regret when starting my fitness journey? My biggest regret by far is the fact that I took fuck all photos and videos when I started. So I was someone who didn't really like the way that I looked. I used to be fat. I also used to be very skinny. And as such, I wasn't really inclined to take too many photos, at least definitely not photos with my fucking top off. So as a result of that, I could have really, really epic transformation before and after photos and videos. But as a result of my lack of confidence in how I looked physically, I unfortunately don't have that luxury there. So if you're starting out on your weightlifting journey you are new you're not really liking how you're looking have the perspective to see you know i may not like how i look now but imagine being able to compare six months of progression to my starting point so by far my biggest regret and definitely for someone who's starting out on your fitness journey it's not a mistake that i would be making so what football team do i support so assuming that you mean soccer team I used to support Liverpool, but uh, over the last number of years, I haven't really been keeping up to date with what they're doing, how they're performing, because in essence, I just grew out of it. And by all means, follow these things recreationally or just as kind of like a hobby. But you definitely see some individuals who make like how their team, their team in the Premier League are performing the fulcrum of their life or their existence. You have people who allow whether or not their team won on a fucking Super Sunday to affect their mood for the entire week, to affect their interactions with other individuals. I think if that is something that you're experiencing or you know someone like that, I think it's time to take stock of what the fuck you are doing. For me, I just don't really follow these football teams because I know that they don't know who I am or what I do or that I even fucking exist. And all of my satisfaction, my fulfillment from life comes from what I'm doing on my own personal journey, whether that's physically, whether that's financially, whether that's to do with the social media that I'm doing, the business that I'm growing. I just don't have any other bandwidth to outsource any fulfillment or satisfaction to something or someone that doesn't even know I exist. So I think a lot of people should really focus on themselves a lot more. By all means, following soccer or football teams as a side hobby, but not letting it become the complete and utter fulcrum of your existence. And believe me, there's plenty of fucking people out there and you know who you are down in the pub on a fucking Saturday afternoon screaming at the TV because the referee didn't give your team the right decision tweeting or posting on facebook fucking jose Mourinho out or whatever the fuck like you know you're 40 years old dave <laughs> you you have a job you have a wife you have a fucking set of kids am i gay uh no i'm not gay uh, nothing against people who are gay, uh, but believe you me, after 24 years, you tend to have an idea right now of, of the things that you like and more specifically the things that you don't like. And for me, I just don't see myself, um, what's the best way to put this, sitting on a cock anytime soon. Is there any value in doing ab exercises? So there is value in, certainly in doing ab exercises. Your abs are a muscle group like any other muscle group. And in order to grow, to develop them, to strengthen them, they need to be trained throughout a full or at least close to a full range of motion. It's just most people do absolute wank exercises that they think are targeting their abs when it's actually just glorified cardio. So when you're doing things like fucking mountain climbers or flutter kicks, it's not really training your abs with the purpose or the function that they're meant to perform. So your abs are responsible for opening and closing that gap between your rib cage, rib cage and your hips. So in order to effectively target them, you need to be opening up that gap and crunching or closing that gap in. And you need to be doing that under load. So the best exercises for abs or strengthening, developing your abs is going to be cable crunches, in my opinion, decline sit-ups, maybe hanging leg raises, bringing your legs above 90 degrees, and ab wheel rollouts. Doing ab circuits, flutter kicks, ankle taps is not the way that you should be training abs. Like any other muscle group, you should be selecting a weight that you're capable of handling for a moderate amount of repetitions. You should be looking to progress with that over time. It's not that training abs is pointless. It's just that most people do it fucking wrong. So have the Wokies tried to cancel me for saying stupid shit like being healthy is fat phobic? Well, I'm not sure what you mean, Dan, because being healthy is fat phobic. It's 2023. Get with the fucking times, mate. Uh, no, but they have uh, many, many times. But at the end of the day, I don't work for anyone else. So I'm not really too sure how you can 
cancel me. And also my feet are just so firmly rooted in the concept that being fat is unhealthy and being healthy is not indeed fat phobic or indeed bettering your physical circumstances it doesn't automatically mean that you hate fat people. It just means that you hate being fat, which is completely and utterly respectable and completely and utterly fine. Um, so yeah, uh, they know my stance at the end of the day. It's really people who kind of sit on the fence with these fucking issues that are the most susceptible to getting cancelled or, or the most susceptible to, you know, having these fucking weirdos coming after them. Uh, but really, I think people know where I stand on these issues. So uh, at the end of the day, it is what it is. Say la vie. And how is finasteride going? So a lot of people seem to think that if they take finasteride, that their balls will either shrink or swell, that they won't be able to get a hard on, and that all of a sudden they'll start growing bitch tits. Uh, but that's not the case, uh, or at least hasn't been the case with me. I've been taking one milligram of finasteride every single day, which for some people might be a heavy dose, but... I just don't really read into these things too much. And so far, I haven't experienced any sort of side effects. Although, you know, I'll let you know the next time I'm with a woman, whether or not that erectile dysfunction comes to the forefront. I actually, funnily enough, had erectile dysfunction before I started taking finasteride. Um, and no matter how hard I tried, or indeed how hard she tried, I just couldn't get that shit up. Uh, but nothing to report as of yet. Uh, aside from an impeccable hairline and a really, really thick head of hair, for which I am eternally grateful for, at least for the time in which I have it. Tips for bench pressing when you go to the gym on your own. So the first tip is that you don't necessarily need to bench press. If barbell bench press is something that you feel a little bit nervous doing, that's going to be a, a potentially a limiting factor for your ability to be able to progress that exercise. So the first tip is you can do plenty of machine presses. You can do Smith machine pressing. You can do dumbbells. They're going to be a little bit safer than the barbell bench press. So you don't have to do barbell bench pressing. But if you wanted to do barbell bench pressing safely, what I would do is grow a set of balls and ask someone to fucking spot you. You may need to do your, your research or suss out an individual a little bit beforehand to know if they're going to be suitable for spotting you, but there's definitely going to be a myriad of different people who are going to be absolutely honored and privileged for you to ask them to spot them because at the end of the day, it's a compliment. They think that if you're someone, if you're looking around the gym and you pick out someone to ask for a spot, they're going to take it as a compliment that they're a strong, secure, assertive individual who's going to be able to pluck that bar off your chest if you happen to fail doing it. What is my best advice for when you start to plateau on a cut. So if you're no longer losing weight, you're no longer losing fat, you're no longer getting leaner or seeing progress in any of the metrics that you are monitoring, something is going fucking wrong. So it's important to understand that at the initial stages of a fat loss journey, you're going to see progress a lot quicker and at a faster pace than you will see in the later stages. The biggest thing, however, that I see with clients who stop making progress is the fact that they, they stop being as consistent as they used to be. In the earlier stages, they're nailing their nutrition, they're tracking every morsel of food, that goes across their lips. They're hitting their steps each and every day. They're doing their cardio. But then as time goes on, they get a little bit more complacent or they just get a little bit bored of the process. As such, they're missing meals here and there. They're drinking a little bit more often. They're eating out more often. They're starting to miss steps. They're not being as consistent with the cardio session. So, so in most cases, it is down to an increase in complacency that people stop seeing progress. So you have to continuously remind yourself of what it is you signed up for, what you were doing and what you were hoping to achieve. And understand that in order to achieve that in the most efficient efficient time frame possible in a time frame that is going to keep you as motivated as possible because you're not essentially prolonging a process that doesn't need to take as long to complete. Yes, it may be a pain in the fucking ass to show up and to track every single meal, every single snack that you consume, but you know that if you do this right, the process will be over sooner rather than later. If you stop seeing results, you stop seeing consistent progress week to week, that's where you fall out of love, you fall out of rhythm with the whole entire process, and that's where you really, really stop making progress. So hold yourself a accountable to staying as consistent as you always have been and in most cases you're going to see the results that you always have. Now it is important as I said that the leaner that you get the slower your rate or perceived rate of progress is and if you are being 110% consistent you can see that your progress is starting to slightly slow down more so than it maybe should. It may be an idea to recheck your calories maybe drop your calories by 1 to 200 or increase the amount of steps that you're doing by a few thousand each and every day in order to get the ball rolling again. Because even for those of you who are being consistent your energy requirements as you progress through a fat loss phase will decrease and every couple of weeks you will need to make an adjustment 
adjustment either downwards in the calories or upwards in the activity to maintain a similar deficit to the one that you've always had and hence see progress at the rate that you've always seen it. So aside from that, that is going to wrap up today's Q&A. So a little bit different, a lot of questions and asked and indeed answered within that. So if you took some value from it, as always, I highly appreciate it if you could drop it a like. It really does help me out. I could even appreciate it even more if you could drop this video a subscribe and I'd appreciate it even, even more if you tuned in to the next one. Take care.